You're there, Nancy. There I am. Hi. <laughs> Good yeah. evening. Um, it is a little bit after seven, and this is the um, June 9th, mm -hmm. 2022 meeting of the Concord Historical Commission. And I'm Melissa Salfield. I'm going to call it to order. And I believe, first of all, we have to make sure we have a quorum. So um, you have to take a roll call vote. Roll call vote. So, uh, Alan, please state your name. Alan Bogosian, present. Nancy. Nancy Nelson. Uh, Rebecca? Rebecca LaMaitre, present. Uh, Chessie? Chessie present. So Chessie is an associate. So that's another issue we need to flesh out um, a little bit later. And we do have a guest, Kristen Dahlman. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, so uh, we do have a quorum because that is, there are at least three of us, Alan, Nancy, and myself. So we can um, properly hold this meeting. So. I would like to, if it's okay, because I think the first item on the agenda, which is to review the draft rules and regulations for the scenic roads bylaw, will take a little bit more time. I would like to just move quickly to um, number two, the historic house marker. Um, and I believe, Alan, you are our designated um, member who over kind of is overseeing these. Yes. So would you... Uh, you know, please leave the discussion about the um, application for one Sudbury Road. This is for the application for one Sudbury Road, and there are um, reading through. Um, they fulfilled the, uh, the the three criteria: the age, um, the the gentleman who resided in the home, uh, George uh, Merrick Brooks. Um, and the, the period uh, and style of the house. So it meets all the criteria that we're looking for. Um, before we take any vote, I just have a little, uh, just a little comment that um, I know they said George, the George Brooks house, which is perfectly fine, but um, because he's a descendant of Mary Merrick Brooks, Mary Merrick Brooks is a really important um, uh, woman in Concord history and her position on abolition and slavery. And I think it would be an important aspect to include George Merrick Brooks. And I, you know, I, I don't know what the homeowners would think, but I, I would hope they would approve of that. So that's, that was, would be what I would recommend. What do you mean include? The middle name, his middle name, George oh, Merrick. Oh, oh. It is included, George Merrick Brooks, it is included. Well, but that's just, not to, just to add on to that, because Melissa, I'm glad you raised that. And I, I think it was Bob who had said in the future, wouldn't it be nice to have the husband and wife's and name? Wife. Um, and I don't know who George's wife was, but I'm sure that's very easy to discover. And I think that that's important as we add more of these around town. Uh, I don't I don't disagree with that. I just really feel strongly that Merrick needs to be in there. OK. Um, in an, a nod to his mother. <laughs> well, it isn't Mother's Day. Wouldn't it have been appropriate if we'd done this last month? Let's um, see. I, I, so, don't know what, I don't know what the proper protocol or procedure is. Would I call, get back to these people and, and let them know after? No, I, I'll take care of that, Alan. Okay. okay. Um, so, but is the question whether to um, find out who his wife was and include her in this marker or not? I think we should in, we should revise a policy if we have a policy that might might do that. Is there a policy about this? I'm kind of, oh, there's no policy? About I don't think it? there's a policy. No. Well, that, that was part of our conversation, I think, for the House on Elm Street. Yeah, and it's come up before several times. Um. I have no objection if we know who she was. I think it's, oh, geez. Uh, I, I think it probably was in their application, which I didn't print out the, all of it. I did. Um, so no, if, I it. if we were to do that, because her middle name isn't Merrick, how, how would you propose we would list it then? His first name, middle name, and, and his wife so-and-so, so-and-so. I mean, remember these plaques aren't that big. So oh, if we were to say George Merrick, the George Merrick Brooks and no, Ethel would, Waters, no, Brooks or something. Yeah, it would, it would 
be his Nancy, it would be his first and middle name and Mary or whatever her name was, but not mm -hmm. necessarily including her middle name. So it would be George Merrick and Mary Brooks House or something like, I, I don't know what her name was either. So that would be okay? <laughs> For now. <laughs> um, it talks a, a little bit about his mother and father, but, but not about his wife. Never. I, I don't remember. I, I just was focused on his mother. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, it, it's, um, <laughs> so he proposes that, uh, the applicant proposed that it be the George Brooks house and, and the commission is saying it should be the George Merrick Brooks house. Um, and yeah, nothing. Alan, I mean, did you read through the area form? I'm just skimming it really quickly. Yeah, it's just that, you know, the, and the property was inherited by Judge Brooks' wife, Mary Brooks, and that all it talks, that's as far as it goes on her. Oh, her, her name was Mary. That was a guess by me, by the way. Good <laughs> <laughs> guess. Um, and, <laughs> I, just, I just picked a name. <laughs> well, we're setting a precedent here, right? Well, I think I, I mean I think it's a good idea. I, I I do. We don't we don't have a specific policy. It's just always been kind of discussed. Okay. So you want me to find out his wife's name? Mary was his mother, by the way. Yeah, because it, it actually looks like his wife. Have, yeah. No, I don't see anything about a wife. He may never have been married. No, it says the property was inherited by <laughs> Judge, Judge Brooks' wife, Mary Brooks. Wife. Okay. His mother is the one I care about. That's Mary Merrick because uh, Tilly Merrick was her father and that's where he gets the Merrick middle name. Uh, he was married twice. His second wife, yeah, Mary Dillingham of Lowell survived him. Okay, well, so Ken, <laughs> which wife do you choose? <laughs> yes. Who was he married to when he accomplished all of these various titles? Mm. Maybe. <laughs> Mary Brooks. The first one. Yeah. The first one? Not so. Not so. so wait, oh, this, I, is, this sorry, is a wait, 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 Yeah. So in the opening, in the narrative, it talks about Judge George Merrick Brooks, judge of probate for Middlesex County for 21 years, the son of Nathan and Mary Merrick Brooks. Mm -hmm. But then in the end, it says the property was inherited by Judge Brooks' wife, Mary Brooks. So how can she inherit the property if he was the son Maybe it's so, another Mary. That's all. It's a different Mary. It's a she. She's Mary Hillingham Brooks, right? She would have taken his name. So there's a Mary Brooks's mother, and then there's a Mary Brooks's wife. This happens in my family a lot. <laughs> well, um, I'd be more comfortable with not including the wife on this one, um, and changing the policy and have the proper research done. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I would agree with that too. Okay, so, however, uh, I, I still would like it to be the George Merrick Brooks house. Um, yep, oh, okay. Um, would someone make that motion, since I think I can't? I so move that it be named the George Merrick Brooks house. Second. Second. Okay, 1872. Thank you, Alan. So all in favor, Alan? Aye. This is a roll call vote. Oh, yes. Nancy, yes. I have to, you have to say it publicly. <clears throat> uh, Melissa, aye. So that's three votes, yes. And then, yes, we can explore the a, a policy because we don't have one yet. Okay, so thank you. I, I will. Um, can, I, can I ask one question? Um, Alan, do you know what color the house is going to actually be by any chance? I do or not because I, I do not. Is it going to be that white? Do does it? I can find that? out. I can find out. It's, oh, it's, no, that's all right. Well, no, I can find out. It's either going to be the color it 
it was, or they got HDC approval to change it a new color. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'll ask somebody on HDC. Don't, don't anybody worry about it. Well, I'm not going to worry about it, but I'm going into the office tomorrow so I can look it up. Yeah. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Then. Um, okay. Um, so do you want this on your agenda for next, uh, next month, next time? What the discussion of the policy? Yes. I think so. You know, we, we should tighten this up and also, you know, eventually we're going to have a newspaper in Concord where we will be able to, you know, issue stuff like this or have little press releases. It used to be, you know, we would periodically send something to the paper that for those interested, you, you know, apply to the historical commission for an historic house marker if your house qualifies. Um, and because the paper has been kind of <laughs> absent in the world of Concord for a while, we don't do that. So yes. Um, so I would like actually then to please, because we do have an issue of uh, membership, I'd like to go to number three, which is the commission membership, you know, last month, we interviewed another candidate, Ryan Hanley, professor from um, um, Boston College, who is uh, lives in Concord in a historic house, Reuben, Reuben Brown House. Um, so we have that. That leaves at least you know two candidates. We have definitely interviewed the uh, our three candidates, um, Mr. Ham, Professor Hanley, Nancy Frizzella Lee, and Sophia Ganim, who I, I I suspect are still interested. Um, I would like to open this up to the uh, membership if, uh, because we had talked last week, last month about this week, this meeting, excuse me, um, nominating and voting on someone for the associate members, even though Elizabeth informs me, we, we don't really have associate members, but traditionally we have. <laughs> no, so you can, you and and it, it may just be that you know just long standing where there's associate members and that's what they're called and they're just people that are you know always come to the meetings they actively participate in the discussions and but they can't make a, up the quorum and they can't vote but they're basically members in training so when yeah. when yeah. A, a member you know seat opens those people have the expertise and the knowledge to to move up, move up. the position so just which, which um, has been the tradition i mean i was on it 20 years ago that's what we did then and that's what we've done in the past several years and you know nancy since you've been here since i've been here so but what i'd like to to look into is whether there is the actual opportunity to have real associates so when they're the Board yeah. of Appeals has it. When there's a quorum issue, um, yeah. an associate member can, the chair can elevate an associate member to fill a quorum and to vote on things. Yeah. Well, so given that, Elizabeth, uh, should we then wait before we no. would? No, no, I just, I, you know, keep, you, no, nobody has questioned the practice and, and, um, and, and oh. it's a good, it's a good thing. So, I'd okay. go ahead and, and okay. okay. You know, so, okay. so I I present those that slate of three, and I would like to um, ask if there are nominations from uh, those of you who are full members. It would be Nancy and Alan and Rebecca. So we have four of us here to nominate someone. Well. So we have three candidates to choose from. Is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've um, I see. you know, we interviewed Miss Professor um, Hanley. We've, um, and actually, I, and, and Nancy Frizzella Lee as well, Sophia not in person, we've gotten their resumes from all of them. Do, we don't have the resumes handy, right? You don't no. to review them. <laughs> oh, no, it's just so it's just the three of us. Mm -hmm. Well, Rebecca's here. Does she vote? Yes, she yes, votes. She can yeah. vote. She votes. Oh, good. Because I, gonna... uh, I may have to step out. Oh, hi, Rebecca. Who's that? <laughs> this is Veronica. We've got a member in training. There yeah. we go. See, there we have a, a <laughs> another associate. <laughs> 
That's well, great. so, um, I mean, we've, we met with these people, we've talked to them. I, I, I thought we were prepared to, to uh, nominate someone tonight and vote. I didn't think we were going to be able to, <laughs> but I guess, I guess that's not correct. So I have something I have to do. And so maybe I should step out. Well, or, or we can but wait there's till the quorum. There's still a quorum. There'd still be three people. Sorry, did we? I don't remember seeing. I remember the um, resumes of the, the the other the previous two, but not Ryan's. Did we receive that his resume? Oh, so he was here. Uh, were you? I, weren't you with us? I, he was here, and, and that was wonderful. And and I, you know, I, I think you'd be a, a fantastic addition. I just we never actually received his resume on paper. Okay, so how, then you know, given there's so little confusion, so why don't we? I mean, I will definitely ask you and I will resend to you the um, resumes of the other two so we can do this in July. And maybe maybe by then we could yeah, um, look that. into the what would be required to officially or formally establish two associate members as part of the commission. I mean, it would it, it, in not the not past, true. there have been uh, um, meetings where we didn't have a quorum of full members and it would have helped to have an associate member available to vote. Okay. I, I would feel good if we could get that straightened out, frankly. Yep. yep. Okay. Okay. So if that's, if that's acceptable to everyone, I will ask um, uh, Ryan Hanley to submit his again, if I have it, and, and the other two, and we'll send that out to you. Okay. So and I can look through uh, Heather's files tomorrow. Okay, because I know we have them. Um, what is his last name? Hanley. Hanley, H-A-N-L-E-Y. Okay. He was- um, Impressive. At last, the May meeting, the last couple of meetings, I think he's actually sat in. Okay, I'll take a look tomorrow. Um, okay, so then, um, then we need to go back up to number one, which is a more challenging. Um, but, I'll, but say I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll be so, right back, really. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth just to um, explain because these were developed out of the planning office and presented at the planning to the planning um, board, and now they're coming back to us, right? Uh, so they were, um, Heather, Gill and I um, drafted these based off various examples that um, we found that Melissa provided that actually town council provided some of them um, and put together um, a first rough draft that the planning board reviewed and discussed the different items that they felt uh, they really wanted input from um, you know, the Historical Commission, Public Works Commission, town staff, uh, who had more of the you know, expertise on different areas uh, to help further um, refine the draft guidelines. Um, and then I will be also sending them to different um, stakeholders. And you know, there's um, you know, a half a dozen developers you know, in the community that are you know, constant having different projects that may be triggered by um, that may trigger this now so getting their input um, so that's um, what I can do is um, you can share my screen okay so everybody should um, be seeing um, the current draft. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Is it big enough? Yep. Okay. I never, I never know. Big for me. Well, anyway. Um, so what I touched, um, I briefly touched base with Melissa before the meeting. Um, this is, you know, this is a lot. Um, these are, um, this is something new. And uh, I can definitely tell you, I mean, the planning board has targeted um, a meeting in August um, to have boards and committees provide their feedback and um, you know, discuss them again. 
um, if a, the commission needs in, or um, the commission needs more time, it, that that's not that's not an issue. Um, the attorney general won't have the ninety days isn't until you know August anyways. So what I talked to Melissa about tonight was kind of going through this, um, talking about what it is the planning board is looking for, have the commission ask any questions and get direction. And then after, you know, not try and hash things out tonight, it's not, um, you know, working by committee is not productive. So um, have everybody go back kind of think about the items, um, write down or you know, email Melissa and, and myself and with your ideas and your thoughts where we can you know, pull those together in a more comprehensive manner and then come back to your next meeting and, and actually you know, insert things that you feel are appropriate. Um, I, I think that uh, might be a, a little bit better use of people's time than trying to you know, develop by committee um, yeah. over Zoom. Right. So um, just so quickly, just going through um, the authority is, it is what it is. It's just straight out of um, mass general law. Um, and so this is where, if you do see something, you know, very quick, I have no problem editing on the fly right now. Um, and some of this is just my um, my o planner OCD. <laughs> it, it's 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 um, it, anyway. So certain things will be cleared up. Like it, it's so you never you know you always talk about Mass General Law Chapter Forty Section Fifteen. You know it's it's never yeah. after the section. So anyways, <laughs> that's just my OCD. So I apologize. Um, and gotta um, love it. The <laughs> The purpose, it, it, again, that kind of comes, you know, comes out of um, Mass General Law. Um, we get into applicability, and again, that comes out of Mass General Law. And then it, we start in with the definitions, and this is where um, the first definition that the planning board was um, wants to get input from. Um, the commissions and town staff and um, what is uh, defined as right-of-way maintenance. Um, I, I think public works and um, the commission and public works staff will uh, likely come up with a, um, a definition and it will be the historical commission and the planning board um, that massages and tweaks tweaks that definition so um, I don't this is not an item that I think the historical commission would have okay um, I think you're going to have thoughts about it in responding to um, to a definition and um, and not necessarily have to craft something I okay. know I I know from the meeting with DPW yesterday, and I'll have to check the recording or the minutes that they were thinking that they might have to meet this summer on that, that it's one of the issues they were planning on getting together again over the summer. Um, yes, they, I mean, they, the Public Works Commission received the same memo as the historical yeah. commission. Yeah, so it's on their screen, but. Um, I would hope so. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. So why do you think um, this won't be a central concern to the historical commission? No, I don't think I don't think um, the historical commission is the I'm not saying it's not a concern. I'm saying I I, I, I don't I, think I don't think you're gonna be the, the primary person to come up with a definition of what right of way maintenance is. We will oh, react to what they say. Fine, fine. fine. I got it. Everybody has their wheelhouse, and and so I think this those, is ours. <laughs> I think those people will develop these items, and it will be other people that are going to respond and react to them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we get through, and and again, you know, what is a road? Um, what is roadway 
you know, repair, maintenance, reconstruction, and paving work. I imagine public works and the commission and staff will have um, thoughts on that. Um, Stonewall. And then this next item was where the um, planning board was hopeful that the commission could help. And also when um, the new senior planner, Heather's replacement starts on Tuesday. Uh, so um, her name is Ann Clifford and she is coming to us from the city of Waltham. She's been the curator at the Stonehurst, the Payne estate um, for, for couple decades. Wow. So yeah, big change. Big change. We're, we're really excited. So um, I'm, I'm, um, I know that she'll have some ideas about this as well, but the conversation that the planning board had when they were talking about stonewall repair and maintenance is um, embedding some measure in the definition where and I can only give you an example, and this is why um, I feel it's important to have the conversation, then everybody kind of go back and think about it, is let's say you have an older dry stacked stone wall and somebody is, you know, wants to put in a new driveway and then extend the stone wall, um, making sure that it's, you know, are, you know, they're not now um, putting cement in the stone wall that can be visible or adding capstones to the stone wall or getting stones from um, New Jersey that are a different, you know, texture or color or, you know, those were all the thoughts that they were thinking and um, trying to come up with a way to define what repair and maintenance means. Um, is this and um, keeping the historical the integrity? Is this one of the exemptions? No, oh, this is no. It's just the defining what would it's it mean definition. to maintain or re main? What would okay. maintenance be in the stone okay. wall? How do you define okay. the stones? Okay, but oh, I thought it was defining the exemption. I did too. Well, I you trying I mean, to define what would it, what constitutes stone wall repair and maintenance? Just definitions. Can you go back up to 1.4? Or do you know what 1.4 one is? Yeah, this one is just the definition of it, not in all the definition section, right? Yes, right. This is just what definitions are. Uh, Elizabeth, oh, okay. we, we're, we're at the R and the S and the T. Is there a definition of the word maintenance? Yeah. Um, no, because maintenance, for that's why there's three different, you know, what is um you know what is right-of-way maintenance which would be um but i, th I think we have of, to delineate and say what, what does the word maintenance entail yeah but for 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 different things it means different items you know roadway meet maintenance means um you know putting crack sealing um uh you know grinding in place and and resurfacing but right-of-way maintenance would be um you know mowing the roadside and um trimming brush and um but does, does the word maintenance mean upkeep or I'm, I'm going back to my electrical code book where we have a section of mate of of definitions and individual words are defined and would maintenance be to maintain or to fix or to repair or to upkeep? This, and then when we group it with other words, it takes on a totally different meaning. This, this, is, Im yes. this is important because um, right away maintenance in terms of vegetation clearing and management, um, the town uses um, something I haven't ever seen it in action, but it's like a, a vertical rotating cutter that just slices mm -hmm. off trees X number of inches or feet from the edge of the road. Do you know what I mean? And it mangles vegetation. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know, I think what, what would be, I, I'm looking at this because I think maintenance is gonna be excluded 
routine well, they're, will I mean, be excluded from this bylaw. And I want to know what maintenance is. I kind of agree. Uh, I agree they, with Alan. The, it's important to know what routine maintenance is. For that's the that's right why way. that's why we're defining what okay. right of way maintenance okay. is. That's why we're defining okay what roadway mm -hmm. maintenance is. Gotcha. So these are all definitions of yeah. Gotcha. What those items are. Gotcha. Okay. Elizabeth, has has there been any sort of compendium of of definitions that other towns have used for these terms that um, we could kind of compare some and maybe of, some of these, yes. Um, that's where that's where some of these we started okay. with mm -hmm. was definitions. But some of them also are kind of vague too, which could be good, could be bad. Uh, well, <laughs> so so, but to to. So Nancy's um, to to your point about maintenance, um, it, it's actually in the scenic road by in the scenic by roads bylaw itself. Maintenance is exempt. So um, you know this this bylaw is not going to um, it's not going to alter the way that public works does their roadside maintenance. Well, isn't it important to know what maintenance includes and doesn't include? And, and that's why when I, when I think when we get input from Public Works, we're going to define, we're going to find out exactly what they think it means. Okay. And I think that's, that's, what gonna, you, yeah. that's, that's where the conversations mean, are going to start. I mean, you know this because we've talked about it before, but you know, the, the light plant clearing and what they call maintenance um, the land trust called butchering, wicked, wicked destruction. <laughs> so well, it's important maybe to build that, try to build some sensitivity into those operations. I know you're after them on it. <laughs> I know that. Well, I mean, Elizabeth has already said that the, under 1.4.2, the public works is going to be, uh, they are going to provide some kind of definition that we will respond to. Right. Under 1.4.6, I think they're looking to us to come up with some kind of definition of what, what does it mean to repair a stone wall, may repair and maintain a stone wall. And as Elizabeth was her, her suggestion was, you know, do you, we would not allow stone that's come, that's brought here from Georgia. Is this should be New England stone, I, right, Elizabeth? I mean, it needs to be to that specificity. And the other thing that, well, this isn't maintenance so much, but uh, applies to driveway cuts and other cuts in stone walls. A practice in the National Park when cuts in stone walls had to be made to accommodate the Battle Road Trail. We, um, we, yeah, you can't see this, but we moved the stones in a way that was perpendicular to the stone, to the wall that we had cut through and piled up those very same stones right there where you could see. And okay, so let's, let's that's continue. Not so let's, let's continue because now okay. you're, you're not talking about a, a right. definition, you're talking about a, a requirement for an action. So yeah, um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll- Moving along, you. okay. Okay. Um, so next is just the procedures on how you file. Um, what's highlighted right here is something that I've added since the draft that you you got. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason being is that further, um, do I need to make this bigger? Is that helpful? That's helpful. That's good. <laughs> yeah. um, so this one right uh, here, and I, and I just did this while I was waiting for people to, um, to get on the meeting. Um, when we get a little further down, we have the criteria section. And I think it would be helpful if uh, an applicant basically in their narrative said, here's, here's why my project meets these criteria or is, or is not even applicable to these criteria. And I think it should be the applicant in, you know, informing the planning board as oh. part of that application and not the planning board having to figure it out for them. So yes. I just added that yeah. one. That's good. Um, I like that because I was trying to figure out how we were gonna do 2.3 and all those um, items. And then just, you know, just if there's any other material or, or you know, something they want to show, um, 
and it's not just proposed changes, it's whether they're going to do any restoration or replanting. And then Excellent. the rest is just application requirements. Yep. Um, these are just the requirements for the public hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, um, there's, there's nothing in the state legislation that talks about what type of noticing you have to have, except that it has to be, you know, 14 days, you know, seven, at least seven days prior, but as far as who you notify, so we're gonna just stay consistent with, um, this is special permits, site plans, natural resources commission, it's abutters to abutters within 300 feet. Um, the only difference is that we put abutters to abutters within 300 feet of the proposed location yep. and, and not the property. Because if you have a huge property, I don't need to notify abutters that you know, are on the backside of a property off a different road. Um, so we just thought that 300 feet from the location would be- um, Makes sense, yes. Makes more sense. Uh, and then a joint hearing with the tree warden, if um, that so applies, which is again, within the statute. Um, and then this is uh, just inf additional information regarding um, the hearing and the planning board holding the public hearing. Um, just again, notifying the applicant is required to um, pay for the legal notice. The, the, this last sentence right here is um, somewhat new. Um, community newspapers uh, used to invoice people for the legal notice um, and they are no longer doing that. Um, they will not run the legal ad unless the applicant pays for it upfront. So okay. we prepare the legal ad, we send the legal ad to the community newspapers, they contact the applicant tell them how much it costs, the applicant has to pay for it, then they will run the ad. Um, so our, our concern is somebody who doesn't um, go in and pay for the ad and the ad doesn't run, then the planning board can't hold the public hearing. So while I, it, it's not, um, it's not a sig it's not as a significant issue as some like jurisdictional permits such as a special permit or a subdivision um, so we just want to make put people on notice that if the ad doesn't run then your application is technically incomplete um, so that we don't get into any situations of constructive approval so what happens though if they don't they sort of ignore that and they go forward with doing some of their stone wall, then they're in contempt. No, um, well, then they're then they're in violation. violation. Which and is, then we find them. Which is further down in the okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so this is the section where um, I think the most thought and conversation is going to happen. The planning board, after looking at this, felt that it would be um, incredibly helpful, not just for the board to be able to make informed decisions, but for applicants um, to clearly understand what it is the, you know, the community is looking for with the scenic roads bylaw through these regulations. Um, and so, um, you know, public safety, I, I think um, examples I could possibly give would be um, let's say a developer has two new building lots um, and I'm trying to think of a reason. Also, let's take the Monument, um, Monument Street example where they did three, you know, three lots and they're going to put three driveways through the stone wall. Oh, yeah. They may come through and say, well, we can do a common drive for two of them. Um, down here, but this lot, um, you know, we want to do a separate driveway because of, you know, the site distance, or I, 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 I truly can't think of a reason why a private developer uh, could say they have to do a project that removes the stone wall, or um, I can see where they can have 
um, a project where they have to remove a public shade tree because of sight distance, but um, and <laughs> but my 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 multiple lot example, I can't really think of a reason why a developer would have to have three driveway cuts instead of one or maybe even two because of public safety. But mm -hmm. but I can see Public Works Commission if um, they have a, you know a roadway improvement project to improve. Um, an intersection because of safety reasons and sight distance reasons. Um, so that one I think is going to be um, the one that's going to take the most thought on everybody's part, the historical commission, public works commission staff. Um, but I think uh, the second and third and fourth um, I think the historical commission and your input will be invaluable on on how the you know how the planning board can make decisions on these applications based on those criteria. Um, Elizabeth, are you envisioning a illustrative list after each of them? So, like historical character and values, such as, and then provide some examples of considerations or like a or a, or a paragraph i i one the other both i the planning board has no you know i can see an idea yeah yeah i mean whatever best conveys it i think and sometimes um words and graphics uh are the best way to convey things and so i think that's a great idea there's there, if we if, if we use an image a photo the photographs use that's fine too yep um and then mm. uh, so two three five it, you know the applicant will just have to you know just include in their application what compensatory actions are being taken place and um, you know, how they are going to be accomplished and 236 uh, if let's say it's just if it's just one lot that somebody has bought to build a new house on um, you know, the no build alternate, you know, alternative is that's not an alternative. Somebody has a buildable lot, they have the right to build a house. Um, and Uh, town policies and um, so again I have to I have to kind of think about that and I and some of these um, I mean these came from when the uh, historical commission and the you know the whole the grassroots effort had these items so it might you know again they may be able to help um, articulate what what they were thinking? Well, I can think of somebody I'm going to send these to and ask for help. <laughs> um, That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I mean, although, you know, I, the existence or absence of reasonable alternatives, it, I mean, I cannot see when a builder would have to destroy a stone wall to put his house. I can see why we might have to move it to put in a driveway, or move that or a tree, but to, to but we no, no. But if, if he wants to build a house and has to break through a stone wall, uh -huh. there there is no alternative. He has to have a driveway, right. and he has to you know that, get access to. So that's allowed. That would be allowed. Right. So, well, but we could ask him to. It depends on the circumstance, but it, it could possibly ask him to. Re well, that's what you were saying before. If they turned it in, if it came in like this and turned it a 90 degree angle or something. Well, this is the mitigation that accompanies the destruction of a historic stone wall. Yeah, yeah. And what are those mitigations? So that's where they have to provide what it is they're proposing to do. <coughs> um, and but that that's not a, and so again, that's compensatory actions proposed, such as replacement. Um, and so they they will have to provide in their application 
what they plan to do. And are, are developers allowed by right uh, when there are three developable lots to have three separate driveways or is that something that might change with this? Um, that is that is something that um, could change because of the scenic roads bylaw. Yes. Good. Okay, that's interesting. So that would be, you know, if they have three separate driveways, then the planning board could ask, well, what's the compensatory action, and you know, how are you maintaining the historical character or the scenic and aesthetic characteristics? You're putting in three. Why don't you just do a common driveway and put in one? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's that would be part of that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the next section just deals with the requirements for um, the filing of the decision. You know, when they render a decision, um, and then this is where it gets into. Um, Exemptions, the next one. No. Oh, that's for the decision where they get into the planning board's ability to request a bond for work. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And this is where um, 2.4.4, um, this is where having that definition of you know, repair and maintenance of the stone wall gets into helping the board, def you know. And this is to Nancy's point, the board may require repair or restoration of a stone wall that's consistent with the historical character. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the exemptions. And and item item, and again for item C, this is where that definition of what is repair and maintenance comes into consideration. Um, item B, uh, in, in my opinion, doesn't even have to be there because installation of pavement markings or signage um, isn't going to require the destruction of a stone wall, but um, Public Works had issues with this long before, so we're just going to put it in. I, th I thought this was very important that we put it in. I certainly well, made a point of saying it. <laughs> Um, item A is um, specifically out of the um, scenic roads bylaw that town meeting passed. Yep. And so that's why I think it's important that those definitions um, be developed and everybody have a conversation about them. Um, so A is something that was or is explicitly exempted or it's still up for conversation? No, it's explicit. And but what but what Elizabeth is saying, we just need to define the maintenance. We need to define what that means. The language of this so it's is removal of trees. Well, cleaning so up. It's explicit in the bylaw. This bylaw shall not apply to cutting or removal of trees by the town in connection with right of way maintenance or to right mitigate or avoid hazardous conditions. Yeah. That's determined by or the to mitigate. Oh, okay. Oh, and that's in the bylaw. Okay. That's, yes. Well, that's a tough one. That'll be interesting to see how that works out because the cutting of trees. Um, <laughs> So I have a question though. We in here though we define the size of a tree, Elizabeth. How would that work? Um, um, so the tree has a diameter of six inches, as measured four feet above the ground. So, so that's um, would this apply? Would what apply? Well, would it, if cutting removal of trees by the town is allowed because it's allowed by the law? except that in the bylaw, we define a tree as six inches in diameter about at four feet above ground. Right. So, so anything cuts, above that is exempt. Below that? Below that is exempt. Oh. So that, that would still govern even the town. That's my question. That description of a tree would still govern the, the actions of the town for road. No, road. any anything less than six inches is they not considered do. is not considered a tree under this bylaw. 
Okay. Oh, yes, but if there's a tree that's larger than that, that's why I'm questioning. So for 2.5.1a. Oh, wait, oh. Okay. Let me see what I'm asking. Yeah. If there's a, a tree that they wanted to cut as part of their maintenance, I mean, I can't imagine there is, but if there were, would the definition of a tree the way this is um, apply that in other words, they couldn't cut it down if it was larger than the six inches above four feet? Mm. Mm. I'm not asking it. No. Very well. I mean, if, if, there's a, if there's a tree that's greater than six inches, I, so you, you, um, so you have to kind of take a step back and think about, we're talking about the removal of stone walls and trees in conjunction with roadway work. So, um, and, and, and just general maintenance of a road. Well, I can't there, imagine because general there, maintenance there on the road isn't going to remove it, the stone wall. Well, and, and the general maintenance of a road is is likely not going to remove any trees. A tree larger than six inches, four feet off the ground. Right. Okay. No, but the pruning will be pruning will be could be could be disastrous. Well, that but that's but pruning but, is not but removing. Yes, but that's just exempt, I think, right? Yes. Let's see how that works. Okay. Okay, got it. As because we've all seen those pictures of beautiful old trees with the center cut out of them so that power lines can go through them, right? So that's that's kind of the classic horrifying thing to happen to a tree. It is, but that's exempt. I mean, they're allowed to do yeah. that. Right? So that is not going to cover it. Yeah. Which is not a surprise, I guess. So I'm just in general, you know, that that issue of maintenance for trees is it's a it's a it's a double edged sword because you you either um, don't do certain maintenance and you have to be um, ready and expected to lose your power for days because they can't um, you know they, they can't get in there and they can't restore power or you may be you know not be able to get out of your road you know because of you know certain trees so it, it really that really is where this is going to be a, a somewhat difficult conversation. And um, I truly do not think this bylaw would have gone anywhere. Yeah. No. Oh, no. no. Yeah, no. I agree. Uh, absolutely. No. With, without <laughs> some ability for Public Works and CMLP to, to keep the roads open and the power on. I, I, don't know. I do think there's room there for um, collaboration and mutual discussion when and if we can ever talk to these guys again um, well, one on one because I they don't C CMLP apparently does not have arborists and and the damage right. that can be done is pretty severe and that's not needed and it may not be covered by this but it's a conversation that might be important. But right now, can I, ask Elizabeth, before this uh, scenic roads bylaw, if the light plant was uh, going through and cutting trees, did they need to consult with a tree warden before they did that? No, only to remove a tree. Yeah. So now it will require them to, to, to talk to the tree warden. Isn't that correct? Mm. To, to, no, to remove a tree. So it's, it's still the same. It's still okay. the same. Okay. So cutting or removal is <laughs> exempt as determined by the tree warden to eliminate or avoid hazardous conditions. Which is, yeah, he's right. allowed to do Maybe. that now. I'm sorry? He's allowed to do that now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's, that's not helped. That's okay. why we bring generators in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> They'll have to be electric. 
um, and that won't, uh, cause you can't have gas, but um, the, the, the one point I want to make is that the issue that you're bringing up, Nancy, on how maintenance is done should be completely outside of the discussion of the scenic roads bylaw. Well, that's that, interesting that, because repair and maintenance of a stone wall is also, <laughs> anyway. But, but how, how tree cutting is being done should be a conversation that everybody should just be having. Yeah. If, if how it is being done is not acceptable to so many people, then the conversation, those people need to have those conversations, bring it up with, you know, the public works director and the, yeah. you know, CMLP director. And that's a, that this should not be the catalyst to have that conversation if it's been an issue that people have had. Yeah. Because that's okay. The, I mean, they're, but we should be having, some of us should be having those conversations. I yeah, think. but independent, I get with Elizabeth said, independent of this, that's yeah. another issue. And that, that's been going on before the, the scenic roads bylaw was the, right. you know, and, 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 and it should, it should continue all on its own merit. It, you know, that was an issue that people brought forward before this was even the scenic roads bylaw was discussed. And no, I know. And, so how 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 things get done is a different conversation as well and, and why the, and why they get done if it's on a scenic road here's here's the question in terms of other scenic bylaws in other towns um byways laws or whatever you know what i mean um i'm all mixed up between byways and scenic roadways <laughs> um so how have other towns handled this do you know Melissa, you've read an awful lot of other. I have, but I don't know because I mean, the only town that I talked to in, in Carlisle in depth about this really was Carlisle, and yeah. I'm yeah. be happy to. Okay, never mind. It's something I'll just keep in the back of my mind because I think maintenance, um, although maintenance sounds um, innocent, can sometimes be a big bugaboo. But okay, I'm fine. Um, I will, I, I won't, definitely won't have time to do this in the next week or so, but um, I'll, I'll, I will see what some other communities have. I don't know if there's other communities that have scenic road bylaws and municipal light plant. So well, Elizabeth, that's what I was going to say, because most of the, most of the towns that would have the scenic bylaws are usually governed by Eversource or National or Grid, National grid. Yeah. And, and they just have an easement through any property, anywhere, any place, any time, and can yep. do whatever they want. Yep. And they don't care about four feet, uh, six inches, or stone walls. Yeah. Oh, oh, so we have an advantage, even though we can grumble, we have an advantage. So, we, so we, we need to speak to towns like Wellesley or Reading. Um, Which I'm not sure they have scenic bylaw, scenic road right. bylaw. So, um, all right, so that oh, I, didn't I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to put that on you, Elizabeth. I, I accept what you're saying. Um, no, I it's it's a com it's conversations that's that are going to happen. So um, yeah, yeah, I'll look into it. And that's one reason why we send an observer to DPW <laughs> to develop that relationship, really. Um, so three one is just straight out of the. Um, Greg regarding uh, coordination with the public shade tree. Um, three two is just the emergency um, conditions. Yep, that's fine. And and then four gets into enforcement. And this is where the planning board had a conversation originally um, from another bylaw. It talked. Uh, it had option one as the option. And um, the planning board's conversation came about, well, mm. you know, what is, you know, what is the right replacement? And if you had, you know, a two, you know, a 15 or 20 inch oak, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to have a, you're not going to get replaced with a, you know, another 20 inch oak. 
No. And is option one um, really enough to have mm -hmm. an applicant seek out um, an alternative that did not require the removal of that tree? It's really hard to figure that out for me from that. <laughs> um, so what, that, is, that is where somebody um, brought up option two, uh, which is from the tree protection bylaw. Um, and I can, I can tell you option two um, has made 98% of applicants under the tree protection bylaw seek um, alternatives and mitigate their tree removal through replanting and not through paying a fee. Okay, I vote for option two. I think that's good, but I think probably the $375 per inch is probably low. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, it's, not, but if you're saying it's effective, that's, um, um, it, that, that's it, has, good. it has been effective. But if you have, uh, you know, if you have a DBA tree of like three feet or two and a half or three feet, that's almost irreplaceable in any kind of time frame that we would recognize. You know, I can, where would they get the tree? I think it's, oh, it's yeah. more straightforward yeah. simply to have a, a fee structure set up. Um, so what I, um, well, as I'm thinking about this, um, you know, having, you know, option one, but um, allowing the planning board to discuss, um, you know, discuss and, you know, option one as, you know, with an applicant, just to provide that flexibility. I mean, because maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe they're, what they want to replant is, you know, significant and wonderful and, you know, improves linear feet of a scenic road and, and one tree gets moved and, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just saying it's, it's yeah. nice. It's nice to have that flexibility, but, um, but that would be only, you know, something as part of the permit and the discussion and up to the planning board. Okay. Hmm. So there, you're saying that these are the options they've suggested, but ultimately they're going to make the decision on which option to pick. Um, well, so no, this will or the this will be both get, of them. Um, this will get basically reformatted to um, shall be come on, uh, shall be. Shall be uh, okay. a fee of and and um, and then have um, the you know the planning board may um, may discuss with an applicant the option or the an alternative replacement may require planting or or something but leave it just leave it as you know the ability for the planning board to have that discussion okay that makes sense something like that i'm just thinking of some of these major trees where really you know you can't find a white oak in a nursery they're yeah. very rare to be able to find. And those are the ones that are, you know, along with the sugar maples that are the biggest and most prominent. That's all. Okay. Uh, and then we just, we have the compliance um, um, section as far as enforcement. <coughs> and then the penalty. Okay. And the penalty so, is what's stated by the, in the, by, in the law itself. Yeah. Uh, yes, right. it, it was an amendment to the non-criminal disposition yep. regulations. So okay. an interesting question is theoretically, um, I think the historical commission does not have the authority to have any approval of any of this. Would that be correct? Does not have any authority to have any approval. 
approval of what? Um, taking down a tree or breaking through a stone wall. Yeah, no, 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 but the regulation. No legal source for that. It's all in the planning board. It, I mean, I, that's the way yeah, it's that's set what up. I'm asking. Yeah, that's what I'm this, Yes, that's the devil. The application process and application comes in, it will be sent to Public Works and the Historical Commission mm -hmm. um, for your, your review and recommendation. Right, right. Okay. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I hope <laughs> I hope Alan and Nancy, you got that. And Rebecca, if you're still there, so we need to you know, do our homework and not make Elizabeth do all the work because we really do have to do our homework. I, I kind of knew that that big, you know, we threw in a lot of that criteria um, because we wanted it to pass, yeah. but we didn't think too deeply about what all that would mean. Um, so, um, I will uh, make, I will make the few changes to this and, you know, kind of like, and, um, you know, what you saw here, I will send this version out to everybody tomorrow. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you so much. So um, just briefly, I would like to go to the updates and reports from Observer. Nancy, do you have more to talk about um, um, DPW and Alan? I, yeah, go ahead. Alan can go first while I find the agenda. I, so, sorry, can I just jump in? Because I do have to um, I'm go sorry, real yes, quick. Yes, Rebecca. Um, I just wanted to share, um, if you all remember when the um, there was someone who came before us who had a project with the cemetery connected to the prison. Yes. Um, they yeah. are having an event next Thursday, Thursday the 15th at 6.30. It's um, mass art students have made an art project called Naming the Unnamed that's commemorating the lives of those men buried at the cemetery. Oh, wow. um, and it's at the library in person or on Zoom. So I can um, forward that. I just thought people might be interested in, in attending and sort of seeing where they've gone with the project because it sounds like they've made a lot of headway. So uh, Rebecca, could you send that to me in, in, to, as an email? Because I will, you know, I have a pretty good sized list for the, my historic issues coffees. Um, if I'd known about it, I would have mentioned it yesterday. Um, I will, because I- Yes, yeah, sorry, it just came to my attention two nights ago. So yes, yeah. I will forward you um, the, the PDF with the invitation. And um, yeah, it looks like it should be a really interesting event. Oh yeah, so, that, yeah, yeah, well, oh good. So she's- um, She's good too. So she has she worked with Marsha Rasmussen on that, Elizabeth. I believe so. Yes. Um, and yeah, let me forward it to you. I, I'm not sure. There's it's Concord Prison Outreach, um, and it's in conjunction now with Friends of the Concord Free Public Library as well. And then the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee are all um, working together on it. So okay. that, that's pretty interesting. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, wow. um, I'm sorry, I do have to, to jump. So good night, everybody. Um, and I will talk to you all soon. Okay, Bye, thank Rebecca. you. Um, well, you know what, actually, before you guys, I, I we have a young lady here, who, Kristen Dahlman, who had asked, she had reached out to me. I hate to have people who are waiting um, while we mash our teeth together. Kristen had, um, so hang on, Nancy and Alan, had asked, um, she had been involved in some of the research about uh, efforts behind the, you know, Article 33, but it's specifically about the right. um, four buildings that were in the Thoreau Business District that have historic, uh, historic importance. And she just had asked it, said she'd be interested in doing additional research. So I'd ask you, Kristen, if you'd like to just explain to me what you were interested in pursuing. Sure. Thank you, Melissa, for inviting me, first of all. And um, I wanted to introduce myself first. I'm Kristen Dahlman. I do live here in Concord, 55 Fairhaven Road. And I am a grad student at, um, at BU in historic preservation. Oh. Oh, so I just finished my first year. Nancy, actually, I think I met you years and years and years ago when you were at the Park Service. Oh, how about that? Oh, yeah. how about that? We should talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually working with Margie now too. <laughs> oh, I thought your name sounded so familiar. That explains yeah. that. Oh, good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So um, I had some ideas about the Thoreau Business District and thought there's a little bit of time now that since town meeting and everything. Um, if it's possible for me to just share my screen, I put a little presentation together. Oh, nice. <laughs> and 
see if that works. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I did it. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so I did a little bit of research this week at, at, in the Concord Public Library, and I'm looking at it from a different point of view, where wow. in terms of historic preservation now, we're looking, <laughs> trying to get away from historic houses and um, house museums and looking at the bigger picture, the story of a place, what makes it a place. And I think Thoreau Depot really falls into this category. And so there's an issue that, that there's first your period of significance, which starts in 1895 with the, tr the depot station itself being built. Mm -hmm. And then there are three other buildings that are significant. Um, mm -hmm. They all have inventory forms with macros. There was actually a fourth one as well that has been um, demolished. It was on 178 Sudbury Road and it was a blacksmith building. Um, it's unfortunate because it was replaced with two one-story little square buildings, the, the bank and the print shop. But um, the three other ones are the express station, um, which was ancillary to the depot itself, used for processing baggage and goods coming off the trains. That's Bedford Farms now. 39th Row Street, which is Priest Cleaners. 73th Row Street, which is Conquer Provisions. Um, yeah. And Forbes had proposed to put the two Thoreau Street ones as uh, on the National Registry. As far as I can tell, it didn't happen. Uh, that was in 1991. And I suspect what happened that they didn't feel that there was enough significance for the building itself. But I think looking at it with fresh eyes now, a new eyes now, it does have significance in terms of there's a dwindling architectural style of vernacular yeah. Um, false front shops. And so those two have both integrity and significance. They haven't changed a lot. The depot itself has changed significantly, the two big additions on each side. And then the Bedford Farms building is not that interesting in terms of its significance as a, as a, as a kind of suitcase processing building. But I think together, they all tell a story of a really thriving, vibrant district. And that story is, um, which I think is really interesting, the people itself. Uh, the neighborhood itself was uh, mostly immigrant on Elsinore, Grant, Sudbury Road, even Belknap. There were Irish people, Italians, Norwegians, and Swedes. And these people really contributed to the neighborhood by building it. They helped build the depot, the train tracks that came from uh, Walden, over through the center of town. And um, they lived in this neighborhood and they worked in this neighborhood. This is like your original mixed use kind of, of development. Uh, there were blacksmiths, paint shops, uh, binderies, carpenters, a carriage painter, a large carriage shop on Love Lane. And then we had the, the meat shop and the fruit shop, which are the two Thoreau Street buildings. And this really centers on, this, this all centers on the depot where people were coming in and out, the materials were being moved, mail, livestock, and it was all providing services for Concordians. And so you start to look at what's the role of vernacular architecture in this story? And the National Trust itself is uh, for historic preservation is really starting to foster models that help preserve the American story, the immigration story, um, underserved people, um, stories that have gone unnoticed. Um, and also deploying these, this kind of vernacular architecture, these, these mm -hmm. forgotten places in a way of developing an economic potential for Main Street. And these two can be worked together to build stronger communities. You can take the old architecture, you can introduce new architecture to further the story. They can work together. And um, the vernacular architecture can really work to create a sense of place, yeah. which is I think what's missing yeah. in the Hero Depot district right now. Yeah. Yes. And perhaps that's even a little bit missing in the, the planning board's plan as, vision as well. And there's a great quote from um, the Main Street America program about collectively the Main Street movement is the leading voice for preservation. Um, 
I can't see the, let me see if I can move this. Wait, All the faces are on top of it there. Uh, yeah. Leading voice for preservation-based economic development and community revitalize, revitalization across the country. And it's not often today that you hear historic preservation coupled with economic development and community revitalization. Uh, this is an example in um, one of the early prototypes in Wyoming of one of their storefronts. And it's just, it's inviting, it's dynamic. It spills outside onto the wide sidewalk. And, oops. And so, uh, did I skip one? No, I didn't, okay. And then as a roadmap for moving forward, I think the Thoreau Depot District needs to be a local historic district. It needs to have design guidelines that promote attractive glass storefronts and restaurants. Um, the existing four buildings can be improved and updated through significant tax benefits through the National Registry, uh, through the, the Historic Preservation Tax uh, Credits through MHC. Uh, new buildings can come in that are not a pastiche kind of architecture, but colonial vernacular. And then I think this project would need to work part and parcel with the planning board in terms of zoning changes for mixed use, multi-story, um, height restrictions, things like that. And I was in uh, West Concord today treating two of my kids to uh, reasons to be cheerful. And sitting there on the porch, I was like, you know, they've really done a great job here. And uh, um, the, low, the affordable housing in behind Commonwealth has helped with these design guidelines to create really visible, vibrant structures. Uh, there's a bunch of new new shops in, in these buildings and it's really, it's really changing and becoming very vibrant. So I hope this is something that interests you. I can, I can take it to the next step and kind of do some more research, especially going back to um, the Historic Trust for, Nas for National Trust for Historic Preservation and look at their programs for Main Street America. Um, so I welcome any feedback from you and thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I mean, as far as the Historical Commission is concerned, the only thing that we have any role in is really the um, National Registry work. The right. other, other um, items are certainly under the planning board and HDC, I don't know. I thought that the HDC looked into extending or creating a um, historic district in this area and has never succeeded. Elizabeth, you probably know a lot better than I do. You're, You're muted. Oh. I don't know how far it went or how often they, or when they tried to do that. Yeah. It's not something I remember. Yeah. I mean, I, I know they tried just to extend Sudbury Road. They tried to include, create a historic district on Hubbard Street. Um, but the other uh, things you're talking about, I mean, I really totally <laughs> that it's really about the planning board's efforts and their, you know, their recent yeah. effort. But, I think it all kind of comes together as, I mean, everyone has a part in it and yeah, yeah. there is part of the historic districts. And, and I think, I think it could be approved if it's spun the right way. Well, so well if, if you're thinking was integrated in into their thinking in a different way, maybe, or in a more explicit way. Um, I mean, what you're saying seems to me to echo what some of the concerns were for the future of the Thoreau district. Yeah, and I think this is, just, what I'm thinking is kind of a middle ground. And I think that if some of these ideas are coming from the historical district and the, the historic districts, it's more palatable and the story can be portrayed more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the issue though is it's not an historic district um, and, and right but, now. But the Historical Commission. The Historical Commission, I mean, the, um, work could be underway as you have talked about to um, do the research and preparation for National Registry designation, which um, as so, we know, so, does not really provide a lot Melissa, of protection. Melissa? I, so this is this is now kind of getting um, off of field from your agenda. Yes, it is. Anyway, um, and, yes, totally. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, so I had just asked uh, Kristen to talk about really was the issue of the four properties and National Registry um, and bring this to our attention. Um, well, That's what all. I was, and and I, I think it's phenomenal and, and I think it, it deserves, um, it de deserves to be an agenda item. Um, and maybe it's one where the commission um, asks the historic districts commission um, if they'd like to, and, and I leave this up to Kristen, but if you, uh, there's nothing to say that you guys can't have a joint meeting to have this conversation about the Thoreau Depot. Okay. Right, right. Uh, it, Okay, I'm so I think come back and, and talk. That's totally fine. I think in terms of the national registry, the depot will not qualify, and the um, the express building will not qualify. Possibly the two okay. shops. Okay. Well, so I think um, perhaps this is another thing. As Liz was right, we can take up at a next meeting. Perhaps we'll put it on the agenda for next next week or next month. Excuse me. Um, you know, whether or not we would want to pursue this. I mean, I know also part of pursuit of this, there are a lot of questions. You got to get the owner to buy into this. There's a lot of steps you have to take sure. even yeah. to do any of that. And so, the neighbors as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, thank you very much for your presentation and for your interest. Um, very appreciative. And I think we'll just, you know, for we will table it for now and take it up um, as an agenda item next month, just for okay. additional discussion discussion amongst the commission members. Is that fair? Totally fine. N right, Nance? Nancy? I just, Elizabeth, how, how are we going off track? What's well, uh, on the agenda? This isn't, this isn't on your agenda. No, it's other business. And oh, public other business. That's, where I, that's where I put it. Oh, okay. Other business. Okay. <laughs> okay, but nothing more explicit. Right, we weren't we weren't like trespassing on somebody. No, no, I, I, I think I think this is a conversation that works is, that deserves to be an actual agenda item. Should go on, yeah, okay. Where just it gets sent to the historic districts commission. Um, there's a more you know conversation. You know, yeah. um, you know, get some of the abutters you know notified and yeah. and start the conversation. I think it's the. Uh, I agree. It it, it does it's it. Deserves that. It, it deserves that, and to start having. Um, I couldn't help but think about the connection with planning for the future. So yeah. Anyway, an agenda item. That's perfect. Yeah. So really, but it's just about the Nazareth Registry, and then if we would want to encourage pursuit and discussion with the HDC. I think we got an awful lot on our plate right now. But um, so thank you very much. And um, so I'm sorry, then I would go back to Alan and Nancy about your, the observer reports. I have nothing to report. I've, I've actually been down and out with COVID and for oh, the last two no. weeks. Oh, so. no. oh geez. geez. I'm glad we're doing this through Zoom. <laughs> I never knew anybody who had COVID in the early days, but now all, only people I know have been vaccinated and double boosted practically, and they're all getting sick. Right. So yeah, it's crazy. Get well. Yeah, it's getting <laughs> so, better. Thank you. So I did, I did try, um, I tried to make it through the entire um, Public Works Commission yesterday, actually, and I know that um, the scenic bylaw conversation is something that they're anticipating and maybe we'll keep them from adjourning for the summer. And I thought, oh, what an interesting idea, adjourn for the summer. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, they're always very, very buttoned up and precise about their agenda and how they operate. So there was um, a solid waste and recycling subscription hearing with subscription rates not going up in 2022 or whatever the next fiscal year is. And um, lots of information about Nagar Pond. And I had to leave early this time, but um, I was gonna bring up the scenic byway um, topic with, with the commission because um, some of the scenic byway improvements that uh, the byway committee is contemplating would take place within the town right away. 
So um, out, especially out by um, past Hildreth's Corner and towards Barrett Farm. And so I think they, I think they'd love that. Alan once told me, well, if there's really money, it'd be great. <laughs> so I do notice that they, um, I think it was the town that probably cleared some of the right of way overgrowth on the past recently. So I think there's a partnership to be made there with them. And, and that was exciting. We could talk to them about something fun. Thank you. Good. The clearing, Nancy, you're talking about, is that um, just down Barrett's Mill Road on the right? On the left as you're going, and it's the um, Japanese knotweed or whatever. As the... you're going, as you're going towards the rotary? Yes, on the left. And then on the right, uh, maybe I missed something. Um, wait, 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 how far out of Barrett's Mill? I, it, it doesn't go beyond the Colonel Barrett house, does it? No, well, no. So if you if you from Lowell Road, you take a left onto Barrett's Mill Road, and yep. it's I don't know one, two, three, four. Maybe like after the fourth house on the right, they did clearing in there. Oh, 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 oh in the wetland. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking of oh, okay. additionally on the left, and there's private property there, and then there's the Barrett Farm farm stand. Oh, okay. Fields, and I've talked um, very briefly, very briefly with Alan. Tell him there might be real money, and um, I haven't talked to Delia yet. But there's conservation land there that um, is also sort of marked by split rail fencing, yep. and that would be the idea to continue split rail fencing that direction. Right. And the farmers seem to think it might be good if it didn't get in the way of their tractors. So um, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to compare the um, the discipline of the Public Works Commission with um, some other committees. That you mean, I, like us? Are you implying uh, anything? I, no, like I'm thinking of myself <laughs> as chair. Yeah, um, yeah, it's fun. It's okay. Fun. Well, I just wanted to bring one up to. I'm sorry, Ch uh, Chessie mm -hmm. had to go off. Chessie and I, uh, we told you this before. We are. Uh, we had we met with Jennifer Doherty, who is the local historical commission liaison for Mass Historical Commission, to ask about pursuing this project to update our historic resources master plan. And we learned that Concord's this plan was kind of a one-off. It was unique to Concord. Other towns don't do it like that. That the way Mass Historical uh, approaches this, there's a preservation plan where you kind of you hire a consultant who, who evaluates all of the town's procedures to preserve historic resources and what are the various roles of, of the commissions and individuals. And it's a much more oh, much different kind of pro approach. They also do something where, you know, it's just the documentation and the macros forms. And then they would do a, a historic survey, which is the closest to what this is. This was really kind of created by Concordians uh, for Concord. Um, so it, I, I don't think want to take too much time now because I'd like Chessie to be able to help in the discussion, but we need to decide what it is we really want to do um, to update this. You know, I came up with a, a, a proposal for grant funding that ultimately, remember I've said about applying to the CPC, um, which would update this, expand it, uh, and link it digitally with his, uh, items that are in special collections. So I've kind of an elaborate plan that way, which would be, again, this is unique to Concord. Other towns don't have anything like this, but the, uh, a lot of the, the language in the Envision Concord references the Historic Resources Master Plan. Our own uh, requirements reference this. If something is um, the demolition delay bylaw references this document. If something exists in that, it means it's met a certain qualification to be an historically important. So we have kind of a threshold decision to make. Um, do we focus the update on this or to come up with a whole new kind of survey of historic resources in Concord? Any chance for a hybrid? I like the idea about identifying the sources of um, concern and 
and influence in town for historic preservation. I like that part. I mean, I think I yes, I do. I mean, I think that's worth it because that would identify what needs to happen, maybe and help prioritize it. This kind of does it, but not really. Um, do you have an example of one that's followed the mass historical? Well, yeah. So she, I mean, you can go on their website. She gave us some suggestions. Um, it's like Heritage Strategies is a company that does the kind of um, overview preservation plan, and they've done they work with Sudbury, Beverly, Falmouth, Lennox. So those are probably documents you could find. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, Melissa, uh, what I um, what I suggest is, um, boy, your July meetings meetings stacking up. Um, but I, I think this would be a great thing for your July meeting and then have Anne, the new senior planner, um, involved oh, in. Okay, okay. so given, right it, could I, I mean, it would be fair for me to go in and talk with her and meet, introduce myself and oh, yeah. explain to her. I mean, she may, be a, well, she may be a lot more knowledgeable about all this stuff than I am. We were, um, we were just trying to learn. Yeah, um, I, 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 she did the whole um mass historic preservation area form for the um the pain estate and with its olmstead landscape and so wow. what i'd probably suggest is that you and um chessie meet with her we'll put this on yeah, the agenda okay. for july okay um, and uh yeah, if you're gonna if you are gonna do a cpc grant you should um that should be part of the conversation at your july meeting yep I know, I know. Is that, yeah, that all those deadlines are coming up fast. I know, because we have to, I, I know that. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, and, oh, so uh, final thing is the minutes from, we still have three people. The minutes from May, uh, uh, I just had them, May 12th. Um, do yeah. I have a, a motion to approve the minutes of May 12th? May 11th? Well, mine say May 12th. Oh, that's interesting. The agenda says May 11th. No, so it says May 12th. Mine says, wow, mine says May 11th. Oh, that's public works. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I got it's too many. I got way. too many agendas in front of me on the <laughs> Anyway, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 12th? May I make a motion to approve the minutes from May 12th. <laughs> now I got to get reoriented. Nancy, yes, I second. Okay, Nancy has seconded. So all in favor. Ellen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Yeah. Melissa, Melissa no. aye. So aye. they are passed. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we run an official sorry. meeting? I'm sorry. Oh. You see what, what we put poor Heather through? You guys, are, you guys are fine. It's a very <laughs> relaxed meeting. It's nice. <laughs> oh, to laugh. Is that what you said? Yes. Relax. Yeah. Relax. Oh, relax. Yeah. relax. Um, um, laughing's good too. Okay. So yes, we do have a lot on our uh, plate for next month, but thank you. Um, but it, we, we will, it, it's, um, our, so Anne is starting on Tuesday, right? Yes. Okay. Public comment. Public comment. I, yes, uh, there is a uh, Lois Suarez. Are did, which are you here to have any public comment? Hello. Nope. Hi there. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I just enjoy hearing what's happening. Oh, that's Thank great. You. Thank you. That's Thank really you. Good. Thanks for that's being here. I, I enjoyed the um, presentation on the Thoreau District. That's fascinating to realize that there's historic buildings there because I think the buildings in sort of that era you know we, we're so concentrated on colonial and you know very early things that we forget uh -huh. that there's you know even in my lifetime there's historic things yes, in this exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I'm not thinking that way so thank you that yeah. was a delight yeah, yeah. and those are neat neat little buildings yeah thank yeah. you so I think um, we have covered our agenda. So I think our next meeting is, oh geez, it's in July. It's the second Thursday in July. Oh boy, I don't have my July. But we will July, meet. It's July 14th. Oh, uh, Bastille Day. I was just gonna say. <laughs> Speaking of history. 
Yeah, a bunch of Francophiles around here. Okay. Yes, we'll have a baguette. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, good to see you, Laws, too. So do I have a motion? I make a motion to, to so you don't you do you don't need don't to need make a motion to, to adjourn a meeting. Oh we don't oh, Melissa oh, Esther, oh, you can yeah. adjourn the meeting. Okay, I officially adjourn this meeting. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.